The dull ache at the back of my skull, a mix of boredom and too much cheap wine on Wednesday nights, had become my constant companion. I rubbed my temples, staring at my reflection. The dress, a daring red thing I wouldn't have touched a year ago, mocked me with its vibrancy. Was this really me? The woman who used to laugh until she cried with old college friends, who'd hop a plane to Vegas with barely a suitcase. Jess, you going out? Jim's voice drifted in, muffled by the bathroom door. Typical. He was on the couch, I bet, eyes glued to some sports recap or other. Didn't even bother to look up. Yeah, sis needs me to babysit. I called back, forcing a light tone. He mumbled something in response, likely a grunt or a noncommittal, okay. That was our thrilling Friday night exchange. Pathetic. I walked out, pasting on a smile despite the wave of. Not sadness, exactly, more like a hollow resignation that had begun creeping over me. Jim was a good guy. Reliable, safe, but lately, that safety felt stifling, like a blanket on a sweltering summer day. I craved a spark, a jolt, anything to feel truly alive again. The party thrummed with an energy that set my heart racing the moment I stepped through the door. This was nothing like the barbecues and dinner parties Jim and I usually endured. No, this was different. A whirl of impossibly stylish strangers, their laughter like fine champagne against the soft murmur of expensive music. For the first time in ages, a shiver of something that wasn't dread rippled through me. You must be Jessica, a voice purred, and I turned to find a man with startling blue eyes offering me a glass of bubbly. I'm Andrew, welcome. Andrew? I let a hint of surprise into my voice. I didn't realize this was your, thing. Honestly, I couldn't even place the guy. Jim must have met him through work. He grinned, and oh boy, that grin did things to my insides that no sensible wife should feel. Oh, it's definitely not. But sometimes, he leaned closer, the scent of his cologne heady and intoxicating, a man needs to spice things up a bit. It was like he flipped a switch deep inside me, a switch I hadn't even realized was getting rusty. A reckless, thrilling energy surged through me. I met his gaze, lifting my chin in a defiance that felt both alien and exhilarating. Maybe it was time I spiced things up, too. The second drink, or was it the third, slid down my throat like liquid courage. Andrew kept me laughing, his stories a whirlwind of travel and daring exploits, the total opposite of Jim's meticulously planned weekends. I felt a giddy rush of excitement that was downright dangerous. So, tell me, Jessica, his voice lowered, and the heat in his eyes sent a delicious shiver down my spine, what does a beautiful woman like you do for real fun? The old me, the predictable me, would have sputtered about family and hobbies. But some switch had flipped, and a recklessness I hadn't felt since college flared within me. Honestly, I can't quite remember, I confessed with a laugh that sounded a bit too flirtatious, even to my own ears. That's when I noticed the other man, watching intently from across the room. His wasn't Andrew's easy charm, but a raw intensity that made my skin prickle. A slow smile spread across his face, and something in the tilt of his lips, the flicker in his eyes, promised trouble, a different kind of trouble than Andrew's playful banter. Well, Jessica, the newcomer interrupted, his voice a smoky drawl that sent another, stranger shiver through me, perhaps I could help refresh your memory. His name was Marcus, and within an hour, I was dizzy and drunk not just on champagne, but on the intoxicating attention, the raw boldness, the feeling of being vibrantly, recklessly alive. It was like a forgotten part of myself was awakening, something buried under years of routine and predictability, and I wasn't exactly sure if that was good or very, very bad. The rest of the night is a blur of stolen moments. A brush against my arm in the crowded hallway, a whispered, scandalous proposition in the dimly lit garden, and a complete, dizzying surrender to desire in a guest room I hoped none of Jim's colleagues would ever see. The old Jessica, the cautious and safe Jessica, would have been absolutely horrified. But this new, reckless Jessica, she was thrilled, and maybe a little bit terrified, too, because underneath the thrill, a tiny voice whispered about consequences, about lines crossed. Yet, for the first time in ages, that voice felt distant and weak, easily drowned out by the pounding of my pulse and the heady rush of feeling something truly alive, even if it was tinged with danger. My head throbbed like a drumbeat, and the luxurious sheets felt like sandpaper against my skin. Guilt gnawed at me as I blinked at the unfamiliar ceiling. I'd never done anything like this. Not ever. A sharp stab of regret twisted in my gut, but then, an odd flicker of defiance rose up to meet it. Because beneath the shame, there was also a strange, heady thrill. 
Getting home was like stepping into a warped reality. Jin was sprawled on the couch, snoring softly, an untouched bowl of cereal beside him. The normalcy of it all, the predictability, was almost suffocating after the exhilaration of the night before. I felt a flare of anger at him, at his absolute cluelessness. Hey, how was Lisa? He muttered the next morning, his voice thick with sleep as he gulped down coffee. It took every ounce of strength not to fling the mug across the kitchen. Fine, kids are a riot, kinda wish we. I trailed off, unable to finish the sentence about starting a family when I'd so profoundly betrayed the one I had. The first message arrived a week later. Just a text, no name. I saw you. That dress looked better on the floor. My blood ran cold, panic fluttered in my chest, yet mixed with a sick jolt of fascination. Who knew, could it be Andrew, Marcus? A twisted part of me hoped it was one of them, that it was just a game born from the night's heated abandon. But the messages kept coming. Darker, more detailed. Things only someone who was there could have seen. I started to suspect someone closer. Not Jim. He was too oblivious, but a colleague, maybe. I felt fear snake around my heart, but under that fear, a thrill twisted too. It was sick, wrong, but I couldn't deny the rush that came with having a secret this explosive. I tried to ignore it, pretend my life was normal. But normalcy, it turned out, had lost its flavor. Everything seemed dull in comparison. Jim's jokes fell flat, our dinners were bland, and even my reflection in the mirror seemed muted. The wife staring back looked tired, yes, but also touched by a spark I couldn't fully extinguish, a recklessness I didn't want to let go of. My days became a blur of paranoia and a strange, unsettling exhilaration. With each new text, every cryptic phrase dripping with accusation, I'd cycle through my suspects. Andrew's smooth charm seemed to mask a cruel edge now. Was this his twisted sense of humor? Marcus. Well, Marcus always had a streak of darkness, a dangerous gleam in his eye that perhaps wasn't just for show. Suspicion was a disease. I saw it in how Andrew and Marcus eyed each other across crowded rooms, tension sizzling between them where camaraderie had once been. It started with subtle jabs, snide comments disguised as jokes, then escalating into tense, hushed confrontations that sent a thrill of wicked pleasure through me. After all, I was the catalyst for their descent into distrust. It was ugly, yes, but I couldn't stop myself. Playing them against each other became a twisted game I couldn't resist. I'd whisper to Marcus about Andrew's smug grin, a sly hint that maybe he was the one delighting in my torment. Then, I'd drop subtle barbs around Andrew about Marcus's obsession, a carelessly tossed match to ignite his short temper. Their unraveling satisfied something dark within me, but it wasn't enough. It spurred me on, twisting the knife further. You don't seem happy lately, I prodded Jim one evening, a feigned note of concern in my voice. It was a line I'd practiced, the bait laid carefully. His response was textbook, predictable, even. Tired, work's been crazy, he mumbled, barely looking up from his phone. He always fell for it, so easily manipulated with just the right hint of dissatisfaction. I pushed further, a gentle hand on his arm, a worried frown marring my brow. Is it just work, though? I feel like. Maybe you need more. His insecurity, a tender spot I knew well, flared to life. Over the next weeks, his questions turned sharper, his attention more suffocating. It was perfect, his rising possessiveness became a weapon I wielded with chilling delight. I became the victim in his eyes, his fear making him the perfect pawn in my twisted game. He was the final piece of my puzzle. With everything spiraling the way I'd orchestrated, I felt an intoxicating sense of power. I wasn't just a pawn anymore, I was the queen, and my chess pieces were dancing exactly how I commanded. The final confrontation didn't happen in a dark alleyway or shadowy parking lot like in those bad crime shows Jim liked. It was at a charity event of all places, the kind of glitzy affair where everyone wore pasted on smiles and designer dresses. Marcus cornered me by the dessert table, his eyes no longer smoldering with a playful heat, but blazing with a fury that made me take a step back. We need to talk, he hissed, his voice barely a whisper but laced with enough venom to cut glass. Away from prying eyes, on a deserted balcony, he laid it all bare. He wasn't just a suspect, he was the blackmailer. The messages, the threats. A twisted desire for revenge fueled by my cruel game playing. The realization hit me like a physical blow. I'd underestimated him, mistook his dark intensity for something I could control. How wrong I'd been. 
It was never about money, he snarled, a cruel twist to his lips. You think you can play with people, break them for your sick amusement? I'm going to break you, make you pay for every damn thing you've done. His threats weren't just about tearing my relationship with Jim apart, he wanted total destruction. Leaking the truth to my friends, my judgmental sister, posting proof all over the internet where it would never fade away. He'd make me a pariah, a cautionary tale of a reckless housewife getting her comeuppance. Panic flared hotter than the shame. For all my manipulative bravado, I was facing a force I hadn't accounted for, an obsession I'd helped create. And that's when it hit me. Desperation, yes, but with a flash of the old recklessness bubbling within. Marcus had cornered me, but perhaps I could corner him back. The plan came together with terrifying clarity. It was twisted, dangerous, the kind of thing the old, cautious me would have abhorred. But that part of me was long gone. You want to play rough? Let's play. The words tasted bitter on my tongue, but there was a steely determination behind them. I lured him back to my place, a flimsy excuse about needing to talk, a promise of resolution. He fell for it, arrogance blinding him to the fact that the prey might now be the predator. Inside, it was a scene I'd meticulously stage. A few misplaced items, a hint of a struggle, and my word against his. It was risky as hell, but with my whole world crumbling, the gamble felt darkly thrilling. What happened next is a blur of adrenaline and terror. His accusations turned into shouting, shoving. And then, the moment I orchestrated, the slip, the misplaced object, the desperate act that ended it all. In the aftermath, it was me calling the police, me playing the distraught victim, me weaving a tale of an obsessed lover gone too far. And the beautiful thing, the truly terrible thing, is that it was believable. Cleaning up was mechanical, shock had numbed me, replaced by a chilling practicality. Every trace of the struggle, every item out of place meticulously put back, the scene sanitized of truth. My acting skills, honed during my treacherous game, kicked in on autopilot. I summoned the tears, the trembling breaths, the carefully worded account of terror and self-defense for the police. In the days that followed, there was an onslaught of sympathy, the concerned whispers of friends, the pitying stares from neighbors. Jim, once a dull background figure, became hyper-focused, his concern twisting into a possessive, almost suffocating protectiveness. He monitored my every move as if waiting for me to crumble, for the facade of the distraught wife to crack. The attention, the careful watching eyes, should have been terrifying. It was proof of how easily my lies could unravel. Instead, it felt like a perverse kind of victory. I was trapped, yes, but I'd constructed the cage myself. News of Marcus's death rippled through the tight-knit circles we traveled in. Whispers of, tragic accident, did little to hide the undercurrent of suspicion, the lingering questions. Andrew disappeared entirely, either racked with guilt over failing to see his friend's dark turn or simply terrified of being implicated in my web of lies and betrayal. Either way, my pawns had vanished from the board, leaving me isolated on my ill-gotten throne. I thought I'd crave freedom, the thrill of escape. Instead, my victory felt empty. The constant looking over my shoulder, the jolt of fear at every unexpected knock, the guilt that gnawed at me in quiet moments. This was my prize. The thrill of the game had curdled into constant dread. I'd won, but at a devastating cost. Sleep became the ultimate torment. No amount of wine could blur the faces that haunted me. Jim's, etched with a fearful vigilance that chilled me far more than his complacency ever had. Marcus's, twisted in a mask of fury, and perhaps worst of all, Andrew's, a silent accusation of betrayal cutting far deeper than any open hostility. The police closed the case, a clear-cut act of self-defense against an unstable man. The world saw a grieving woman who had narrowly escaped tragedy. What they didn't see was a prisoner of my own making, haunted by the ghosts of choices I couldn't take back, and the constant, sickening fear that one day, the truth would come clawing its way out. The first few months after Marcus were a bizarre, claustrophobic mix of relief and suffocating terror. Jim, bless his naive heart, bought my performance hook, line, and sinker. His worry transformed him from a lazy, indifferent husband to a vigilant watchdog, determined to shield his fragile wife from further harm. At first, the constant attention was an odd comfort. It meant no one suspected the truth, that I, the reckless adulterous and cold-blooded manipulator, had escaped and scathed. But as weeks stretched into months, Jim's concern twisted into something darker, an obsession disguised as affection. He had to know where I was at all times, checking my phone location obsessively. The questions came too. Innocent at first, about how I was feeling, what I was doing to get over it. 
Slowly, they grew sharper, probing at my every word for signs of a breakdown he seemed both to dread and anticipate. The guilt was a constant companion, a low thrum of unease that sharpened into terror at the slightest provocation. Each passing police car set my pulse racing, every unexpected knock on the door made me jump. I swore I saw Marcus everywhere, in the flicker of shadows, in the faces of strangers accusing eyes burning into my soul. Jim called it concern, protectiveness. But it felt more like a velvet-lined cage. He insisted on driving me to appointments, walking me to the mailbox like I was a skittish child, not a grown woman. His attempts at chivalry morphed into a suffocating control. The irony was nauseating. I'd craved excitement, a break from the predictability of my life. Now, I was a prisoner of my own deceit, trapped in a marriage that had become twisted and unfamiliar. My carefully constructed lies had transformed my own home into a cell. Escape became an obsession, twisting in my mind every waking hour. But every plan crumbled under scrutiny. Running away meant losing everything, the house, the financial security. Jim would undoubtedly spin a sympathetic tale of his wife crumbling under the weight of tragedy, painting me as a victim, unstable and dangerous. The truth could never be known, not without destroying the life I'd spent years building. And yet, staying was unbearable. Jim's overbearing protectiveness made my skin crawl. The weight of my secret, the constant fear of discovery, it felt like it would crush me. I was stuck in a horrifying limbo, desperate for freedom but terrified of the cost. Just when I thought I couldn't sink any lower, a ghost from my past crawled out of the woodwork. It was Claire, an old college friend I hadn't spoken to in years. She'd heard the news about Marcus somehow, and her sympathy call sent a spike of pure terror through me. Claire had no idea about the party, my betrayal, but she knew me. She remembered the wild streak, the reckless glint in my eyes that had been buried under suburban boredom. I nearly hung up on her. But then, a desperate, twisted kind of relief washed over me. Here was someone who wasn't completely fooled by my grieving widow act, someone who saw a flicker of the old me, the dangerous me. We met for coffee, a pathetic attempt at normalcy in the bright, bustling cafe. And bit by bit, I let the mask slip. Not the full truth, of course, but hints. The restlessness before the party, the dissatisfaction with Jim, that feeling of being trapped in a life I never truly chose for myself. Claire didn't judge, at least not outwardly. Instead, she listened, and a strange, twisted connection formed between us. Shared secrets have a way of doing that, even when they're only half-truths. She, unlike everyone else, didn't see me as a victim, but as a woman capable of darkness. And perversely, it was liberating. It was in those clandestine meetings, whispered conversations over bitter coffee, that a desperate plan started to take hold. Claire, with her quiet intensity and her knack for reading people, became my co-conspirator. We tapped into Jim's paranoia, his fear that I wasn't as broken as he believed. A misplaced item he was sure I wouldn't own, a text message with no name appearing and disappearing on my phone. Tiny seeds meant to make his insecurity bloom into something monstrous. Then, the clincher. Evidence, slipped into his briefcase that suggested a hidden connection between him and Marcus. An old photo, a carefully forged note, just ambiguous enough to make his suspicious mind run wild. He'd already begun to doubt everyone around me, maybe now, he'd doubt himself. It was a dangerous game, a house of cards that could come crashing down at any moment. But the alternative, my slow suffocation, was far more terrifying. The tension in our house ratcheted up with each passing day. Jim's questions became accusations, his concern morphed into suspicion. Every time he looked at me, I saw a darkness in his eyes, a reflection of my own twisted actions. It was exhilarating and sickening at the same time. I was playing with fire, and the inevitable explosion was coming. It all went down one rainy Tuesday night. Jim had been needling me for days, the faked evidence gnawing away at him. His usual blandness gave way to bursts of rage followed by sullen silences. I was walking on eggshells. But that night, his suspicion targeted Andrew of all people. A wrong glance at a fundraiser, apparently, was enough to reignite the festering paranoia I'd cultivated. He stormed off, the accusation ringing in my ears. I'm going to sort this out once and for all. The downpour, his drunken determination. It was the perfect storm I'd been waiting for. I knew, with a predator's certainty, that he was heading straight for Andrew's apartment. What followed was a blur of panic and calculated relief. Sitting on my couch, the rain pounding on the window, my pulse throbbed in my ears. Had I gone too far? 
The image of Jim, red-faced and wild, confronting an equally unstable Andrew filled me with dread. Yet, a wicked part of me relished the chaos I'd unleashed. The call came late that night, not from Jim, but from the police. It was as I expected, but also so much worse. A brutal fight, a body, maybe two. The details were sickening, and beneath the shock, I felt a chilling satisfaction. The mess was out of my hands now, a consequence of a game I'd set in motion but hadn't needed to finish myself. In the aftermath, I was a machine. My performance was Oscar-worthy. The tears of the devastated wife, the confusion, the trembling hands clutching a sympathetic detective's cart. Jim's simmering paranoia, his erratic behavior before the disappearance, it became a convenient narrative, painting him as unstable, consumed by jealousy, responsible for his own demise. The investigation dragged on, but no suspicion fell on me. I was clever, they'd say, and brave. I'd endured so much. Yet, amidst the whispers of pity and inheritance that made me nauseously wealthy, true freedom remained out of reach. Sleep became a torture chamber, filled with faces. Jim's, contorted in rage, then blank and lifeless. Marcus's, a chilling mask of accusation before everything went dark. And Andrew's, with its flash of hurt and betrayal, perhaps the worst of all. I hardly recognized the woman I'd become. The wild spark I yearned to recapture was dead, replaced by a coldness that seeped into my bones. The wealth, the house, the illusion of freedom I'd so desperately craved, it tasted like ashes. Winning had come at a terrible cost. I was, in a cruel twist, both liberated from constraint and trapped in a prison of my own design. The thrill of the game had faded, leaving not a triumphant victor, but a haunted woman, forever shackled to a devastating choice. Alone in my echoing, lavish home, I was nothing more than a ghost, a chilling reminder that vengeance is a dish best left. I met my girlfriend at a party. A mutual friend was throwing a Halloween party six years ago. She went and dressed up as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and I thought it was a brilliant costume, so we started talking about it. The two of us connected right away, and we ended up leaving the party together. We had an amazing night together, and from there I asked her out again. I thought we were perfect for each other. She was everything I wanted in a partner and more. We had been dating for about two years when I asked her to move in with me. Ever since things have been better than ever. She was very career focused, but she was unfortunately laid off from her job at the beginning of the pandemic. Her company had to make a lot of cutbacks, and her department was eliminated entirely. She took it very hard, but I was there for her the entire time. I had a good job, so it wasn't impossible for me to take care of us both. Of course, there were some adjustments to be made, but we managed to get through them. We had several friends in common, though we both had our own friends outside of those. Neither of us really felt like we needed to be best friends with each other's friends, because we had our own lives outside of each other. With that being said, most of her friends did like me, and I got along well with them in return. But she just had one friend that I couldn't shake the feeling didn't care for me. Let's call her Claire. I had never done anything to Claire to make her dislike me, but there was just something off between us. My girlfriend would go out with her friends often, and whenever I heard that Claire was going along, I got a little nervous. I was faithful and honest with my girlfriend, but part of me worried that Claire might be putting something in her ear to affect our relationship. Maybe that was just my anxiety, though. When I asked my girlfriend about her, she told me that Claire didn't dislike me, but she thought I was different from the type of guys she usually went after. I knew that before my girlfriend was with me, she had dated a lot of very athletic and dominant type men. I wasn't really like that. I preferred to stay home with her and watch movies or television shows, and most of my time spent with friends was through gaming. I didn't think that would be a reason to dislike me, though. I let it roll off my shoulders, and I didn't worry about it. I was confident that my girlfriend loved me, so it didn't matter to me what one of her friends thought, especially considering that all of her other friends really liked me. Some time passed, and I hadn't even thought about it. However, my girlfriend was acting a lot differently. She'd always been very into her fitness, so her spending a lot of time at the gym wasn't unusual, but I started to notice that she spent a lot more time there than usual. She was going to the gym twice a day, and she was closely monitoring her caloric intake. She was completely perfect in my eyes, and she most definitely was not overweight in any way. Honestly, I was somewhat worried about it, because it seemed almost obsessive. She talked to me about the diet she was on, and how she wanted to transition to a raw vegan lifestyle, which I wasn't too happy about. Going vegan required a lot of changes and research that I couldn't commit to. 
It seems like all of these changes came out of nowhere, and I didn't understand why she was so adamant about them all of a sudden. I didn't think that these changes were because she was cheating on me. I thought that maybe if anything, she might have seen a documentary that spoke to her or something. A few months after she told me she was making that change, I saw her at the cafe around the corner from my job during my lunch hour. She was there with another man. I knew all of her friends, and I didn't recognize him. He was tall and extremely muscular, and he was clearly interested in her. She was facing away from me, so I couldn't tell if she was reciprocating that, though I was nervous about why she was at the cafe with this man to begin with. When I left in the morning, I had just been told that she would be going to the gym and spending time at home. I walked over to them and said hello, waiting for my girlfriend to introduce us. I think she instantly recognized my suspicion, and she quickly told me that he was one of the trainers from the gym. She said that he was vegan, and they were talking about some recipes and changes that she planned to implement in the coming weeks. They asked me to join them, and I did. After sitting with them while they talked about nutrition for a while, I felt like my suspicions were eased. I mean, why would my girlfriend invite me to sit down with her and man she was cheating on me with? When I got home later that night, she explained what happened in more detail before I even asked. She said that they were just talking at the gym, and decided to grab lunch to chat more, and that it was nothing at all. Honestly, I was kind of torn about that reaction. Was she telling me that because she wanted to assure me that nothing was really happening, or did she tell me that because there was something going on, and she needed to get ahead of it? I decided it would be best to trust her, so I just told her it was okay, but to let me know before she has lunch with some random man again. We laughed it off, and she assured me that it wouldn't happen again. The weeks went by, and she started to withdraw from me. We still spend time together, though it was nothing like it was before. I only saw her for a couple of hours in the morning, and later in the evening after she got back from the gym. At that point, both of us were too tired to talk much less do anything else. We practically stopped having sex after a while. Anytime I would try to initiate anything, she would tell me that she was really sore from the gym, or she was tired, and wanted to get up early. I felt like I was just being dismissed by her, and I didn't like it. She actually came home one night before I got back from work, and we had dinner together. It was the first night in a while that we ate together, and I was happy about it. At least I was happy until she got a call halfway through dinner, and left to answer it outside. At that point, I would have been foolish not to wonder if something was going on. I thought about the man from the cafe right away, and I felt like an idiot for brushing it off so easily. I couldn't help but think that I walked in on a date without even realizing it. Later that night, she was in the shower, and I took the opportunity to look for evidence that something was going on in her phone. The first thing that I did was call the recent number that had shown up during dinner. After a couple of rings, a man answered the phone. He said, couldn't wait any longer huh, then laughed. I didn't say anything in response which prompted him to say my girlfriend's name, as if he was waiting for her to reply. I had really been hoping it was some toll collector or scam calls, so I didn't know what to say. I just stayed quiet hoping he would hang up after a minute thinking that it was just a butt dial. Thankfully, that's what happened. I looked through the messages, and I found a lot of evidence that they had been sleeping together almost every night for the past several weeks. It was the guy from the cafe, and they had been staying late at the gym to sleep with each other after it closed. One thing that really caught my eye about their messages was how the guy said that he was glad Claire introduced them. My blood was boiling when I read that. I always knew that Claire didn't like me, but I didn't think she would actively encourage my girlfriend to have an affair. I opened up their text messages, and I searched for the name of the guy, and I saw the conversation with my own eyes. Claire had texted my girlfriend about this cute guy who worked at the gym she went to. She told her that he was just my girlfriend's type. At first, my girlfriend told her that she was happy in her relationship. A couple of days later, Claire sent my girlfriend a picture of herself in the mirror at the gym with a man standing behind her with a large red circle drawn around him. She told her that was the guy she had been talking about. Then she said that she showed him a picture of her, and he was down to go out. My girlfriend told her that she didn't want to at first. The following day, my girlfriend asked her if she had a guest pass for her gym. Then they started talking about how cute the guy was. Claire had actively encouraged my girlfriend to cheat on me with this guy from the gym. I put the phone away and pretended like I didn't know anything about it for the next couple of days. I needed to find a way to get back at my girlfriend for humiliating me. Not only did she cheat on me, she cheated on me, and then I sat at the table with her and the man she was sleeping with. 
the only thing I could think to do was to get the guy fired from the gym. From there, I could break up with my girlfriend and kick her out of my apartment. She didn't have a job, and she had been relying on me for support, so I was going to take that away from her. The first time after I found out about the affair and my girlfriend texted me telling me she was going to stay at the gym later, I took that opportunity to make sure they got caught. From the research that I did on the gym, I found out that it was just a small family-owned business. The owner's information was on their website, so after they closed, and I knew that my girlfriend was still inside having sex with the guy, I called him. I told him that I had left my house keys inside the gym, and I desperately needed them. He was super helpful, and he came back to let me in. When he opened the door, he saw that a lot of the lights were on when they shouldn't have been. He was cursing under his breath as he walked through the gym to properly close down. I heard yelling come from somewhere in the back, where I can only assume he walked in on his employee having sex with my girlfriend. Moments later, my girlfriend ran out of the back room with her shirt on backward and saw me. Shortly after that, the man came out carrying a camera and a tripod. Apparently, they had been filming all of their encounters. I just left, and my girlfriend chased behind me trying to explain what happened. I let her explain because I wanted to hear how ridiculous it sounded, and she tried to make it seem like I was the problem. Everything she said was things that I had no doubt Claire had put in her head. She said that I wasn't exciting, and that I didn't know how to please her, but she never talked to me about any of that. I kicked her out of my apartment, and she went to stay with Claire. I found out later on through some mutual friends that she tried dating the guy from the gym for a while, but they ended up not working out. Neither of them had jobs after that point, and it put a lot of stress on their relationship. On top of that, they had been filming their time together, and they posted the videos online. Their faces were blurred out, but she had definitely posted them on the internet. OP, I'm so sorry you had to go through something like this. It seems like you were really putting the effort into your relationship, and your girlfriend wasn't interested in doing the same. Claire seems like a terrible person who had no business sticking her nose in your relationship. It's such a shame that your girlfriend let her get in her head. The fact that your girlfriend was so willing to film herself having sex with a virtual stranger to post online without telling you is pretty telling. She just seems like a very selfish person, and anybody in a relationship should speak to their partner about things like that first. Blaming you for her affair is a classic cheater move, but I assure you none of this was your fault. If she was really unhappy she could have come to you and discussed your sex life, and you could have worked on it together. I really hope you're able to move on from this. It sounds like your girlfriend wasn't a good match for you, and I wish you the best moving forward. I hope you find someone who will respect you. Now let's move on to our next story. My wife and I recently celebrated our five-year wedding anniversary. She and I have been together since our senior year of college. I had actually never met her until we were in the same thesis class. We sat near each other and I thought she was cute, so one day I struck up a conversation and asked her out. Our relationship quickly evolved, and we both knew that we had something that not a lot of people found. We ended up graduating and moving in together within a year. One thing that both of us really wanted out of life was a big family. We had talked a lot about wanting to have at least three children, probably more. The first step for us getting started with that was to get ahead financially so we can provide for them. We got married and worked our butts off to be able to put a significant amount of money into savings to start a family. We put a down payment on a house, bought the furniture that we needed, and we started trying for a family. Everything in our life was going exactly how we wanted it to. We were thrilled to be happily starting such an incredible journey together. We had been trying for a baby for about six months and we had no luck. At the time, we weren't in a huge rush for it, so we were trying not to stress out and just enjoy the time we spent trying. After a year of trying with no success, we decided that we needed to see a fertility specialist to figure out what the issue was and how to move on from it. When I went into my physical, I was quickly told by the doctor that it was likely my fault that we couldn't get pregnant. When I was a teenager, I had a brain tumor. My family did everything in their power to help me, and part of that included radiation therapy. At the time, I don't think my parents or myself were very concerned with my reproductive health. We very much wanted to make sure the tumor was gone, so we did what we had to. Now, as an adult, I'm learning that I will never be able to father my children because of it. When I left my physical, I had to break that news to my wife and she took it very hard. We both wanted a family more than anything and I wasn't going to be able to give that to her. Though, we still had options and I was trying to excite her about those. After I told her about that, I couldn't shake the feeling that she was mad at me. 
I didn't want to believe that was the case because it was just as heartbreaking for me as it was for her to find out. I could tell that she viewed me differently than she did before. I did everything in my power to try and bring things back to normal between us. I loved her more than anything in the world and I didn't want to lose her over this. We had options and we could work through them to still be happy. Not long before we started trying for a baby, we bought our own house. It was a bit of a fixer-upper, so we were working on it while living in it. There were only a few things that really needed to be taken care of. One of the biggest issues with the house was how the plumbing was very iffy. I could do some things like repair drywall and install cabinets, but we needed to hire a certified plumber to look at the house. My wife took care of that while I focused on other aspects of renovating the house. She hired the plumber and dealt with him most of the time. She told me one evening that the plumber was going to be coming over the next day. She had already met with him several times before, but I hadn't met him yet. I had already planned to take the day off work because I was expecting a large delivery that I needed to bring in. When I met him, it was difficult not to feel a little jealous. He was a good-looking guy. On top of that, he seemed to be a little chunny with my wife. I started talking to him about the work he'd been doing and I quickly brushed off my insecurities and told myself that it was just professional between them. Things started to get back to normal between my wife and me. We were spending more time together and we had even started having sex again. It was much less frequent than it was when we were actively trying to have a child, but I was still happy to be having in general. One night she and I were just sitting on the couch and watching a couple of movies when she started off into the bathroom and threw up. Neither of us thought it was possible for her to be pregnant, so we assumed she had food poisoning, but it kept happening. She went to the doctor and they were able to confirm that she was pregnant. I didn't understand how it happened. I had been told that I wasn't able to have children, yet my wife was pregnant. It was naive for me to think this, but I thought it was a miracle. My wife wasn't as happy as I thought she would be. I assumed she would be over the moon when she got the news, but she seemed almost distressed by it. She was withdrawing from me again and I could tell that there was something seriously wrong with her. I was worried that she wasn't feeling alright because of the pregnancy and I was asking her all the time if there was anything I could do. She started to make very secretive phone calls and hide her phone from me when she wasn't using it. I started to think that something serious was going on. I didn't want to look into it because I was afraid I was going to get hurt, but I knew that I had to. I was able to get a quick look at her phone while she had taken a nap one afternoon and I found information that completely shattered my heart. Of course, it was the plumber. All the time that he had been home with her, while I was at work they were sleeping together. It had been happening since my wife found out that I couldn't father a child. In one of the messages, just hours after we found out that she was pregnant, she messaged him and told him that she was pretty sure it was his. I felt like the world had completely fallen out from under my feet. I thought having a child would be impossible for me and I was so happy when I thought it was happening. I was just a fool to believe that it was mine. The worst part about it was that the plumber didn't really want to be a part of anything. He suggested just telling me that it was mine. My wife agreed that would be the best option. I couldn't deal with my wife after learning about that. If she was going to have another man's baby and then pretend like it was mine, she wasn't the woman that I knew. I was going to divorce her but I didn't know what to do because she was pregnant. It felt wrong to leave her while she was carrying a child and I didn't want to leave her a single mother. My wife caught me while I was looking through her phone. She bolted up and grabbed it from my hands and I just stared at her. She knew right away by the look in my eyes what I had found. She tried to explain herself by saying that she was in a very vulnerable state and he was there. She thought less of me for a while because I couldn't give her a child. I told her that no matter what, we were over. There was still a very slim chance the child was mine, so I wanted to have a DNA test done. If it was mine, we would deal with joint custody and figure that out. If it wasn't mine, I was out of her life completely. She reached out to the plumber and told him about it and he agreed to give us the mouth swab that we needed to perform the test. When my wife was 8 weeks pregnant, we went in to have it done officially. The results came back that the plumber was the father. She told him and he was less than ecstatic. It felt truly awful to leave her, but I didn't really have a choice. It wasn't my child and I couldn't stand being around my wife after she said what she did. So, I divorced her and because of her affair, I didn't have to give her anything. After the baby was born, I tried to stay out of my wife's life. She had moved back in with her parents so they could help her with child care while she worked. 
Apparently, the plumber had decided he didn't want anything to do with either of them and chose not to pay child support like he was supposed to. I didn't want anything to do with my wife when I heard about that I was frustrated. I reported him to the authorities for failure to pay child support and he was forced to pay it with back pay or face jail time. I have a lot of things to deal with personally now. It's hard for me to trust people enough to want to get involved with another woman. On top of that, I have to worry about never being able to start my own family. I think the best thing for me at the moment is just to take some time to be single and figure out what it is that I want out of life. OP, I'm so sorry you had to go through all of this. It's really sad how she turned her back on you after you were both given bad news about your chances to conceive. There are plenty of options for couples who can't have children of their own and it seemed like your ex-wife didn't really want to pursue any of those. It isn't fair for her to put any of the blame on you for what happened. When you were younger and had to go through radiation therapy for your own health, this was a side effect of that. If you hadn't done that then you might not even be here today, so it was the right thing and it's no one's fault that you can't have children. She was very quick to cheat on you with the plumber after finding out the news. It was very selfish of her to use the pain you both felt as a catalyst to betray your marriage. I know it's hard to realize when you love someone but you're better off without a person like that in your life. It's a good thing that you're thinking about taking time to be single because that might be the right thing for you to heal from this. I wish you the best of luck moving forward and I hope you're able to open your heart up again to try and trust people. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please feel free to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, comment below with your thoughts on what happened. If there is a story you would like to share with me about your own situation or someone else's, then please do not hesitate to contact me. Sarah's work barbecue was one of those long, boring things. John was glued to his phone, like always lately, barely paying attention to anybody. So when this guy Mark started talking to me, I was grateful for the distraction. He was cute, with this easy way about him, and when he found out I was into old cars too, we talked for ages. It was refreshing, just having someone who actually seemed interested in what I had to say. After that, I can't say it was a coincidence that ran into him at the gym. Maybe I started going a bit more often, maybe I picked my workout times a little more carefully. He always seemed happy to see me, and we'd joke around while we worked out. It felt nice. Not like with John, not anymore. John just seemed tired all the time, or distracted. I didn't know what was going on with him, but I did know that he and I hadn't had a real conversation in ages, not one that didn't revolve around bills or what to make for dinner. Mark made me feel awake. We'd text now and then about cars, or about stupid stuff happening at work. I'd never done anything like that before. It felt exciting, but a little scary too. One night, after John was asleep, I stared at a text from Mark for a long time, debating whether to reply. He was just a friend, right? Friends can talk. Even late at night. But was this getting a little too friendly? I wasn't sure, and that uncertainty twisted something in my stomach that felt a lot like guilt. The next morning, I felt jumpy. On edge. Whenever my phone buzzed, my heart would skip a beat. Was it work? Was it John? Or was it Mark? The anticipation made me feel alive, but also strangely off-kilter, like I was leading some sort of double life. It was exhausting but thrilling all at the same time. I couldn't stop the back and forth in my head was I overreacting? Or was this the beginning of something more? Something I wasn't sure I was even ready for? The thing about guilt is, it shows. I tried to hide it, to smile like always, make John's favorite dinner to try and overcompensate. But he noticed. Of course he did. Husbands always know these things, don't they? Everything okay, babe? He asked one evening, out of the blue. His question hung in the air, heavy as a thundercloud. Yeah. Fine. Why? I retorted. Maybe a bit too quickly. A flicker of something crossed his face, worry maybe. Was I imagining it, or hoping it was worry, and not suspicion? You seem, I don't know, different lately, John said, choosing his words carefully. Always on your phone, going out more, it's just not like you. People change, John, I said, my voice sharper than I meant it to be. And maybe I'm tired of being the same old boring person. My words were meant to sting a little, to deflect his question. That shut him up for a while but it did nothing to quiet the fight going on inside my head. The car shows with Mark weren't just about the cars anymore. We'd go for walks afterward, 
grab a coffee, and just talk. It felt so easy with him, not forced like things had become with John. And then the messages started getting later. We'd be up way past midnight, half joking about car parts, then spilling bits of our lives to each other. Mark's marriage was struggling too, he told me. He felt like he and his wife were roommates, not partners, and his complaints echoed my own unspoken frustrations. Late one night, a message from him made my heart thump harder. I think about you all the time. I stared at the screen, paralyzed. Should I just pretend I didn't see it? Was that even an option now? A traitorous, reckless part of me wanted to write back, to say I felt the same way. Instead, I closed the app and tried to sleep, the weight of his unspoken words pressing down on me. I was playing a dangerous game, and I was starting to realize I wasn't sure how to stop, or if I even wanted to. The excitement, the secrecy. It felt intoxicating, a stark contrast to the dull predictability of my life with John. John, ever the practical one, booked us a surprise weekend trip to celebrate our anniversary. He meant well, bless him, but my stomach twisted into knots when he told me. The thought of spending an entire weekend with John, forced to pretend everything was fine, felt stifling. Don't get me wrong. The cabin was cute, a crackling fireplace and all, but all I saw was the empty space beside me. The conversations would stall halfway through dinner, the forced smiles and awkward attempts to fill the silence with small talk would be agonizing. The whole getaway, I was on edge, irritable. My phone buzzed constantly, and I'd invent excuses to step away, a sudden need for fresh air, a forgotten item upstairs. Once, I even pretended to have a headache so I could cut a dinner date short and lie restless in bed, waiting for that familiar notification that meant Mark was thinking of me too. Just a little longer, he texted, his words a bomb against the aching loneliness I felt even next to my own husband. Late into the night, we talked, our voices hushed on the phone, spilling out the unspoken frustrations, the desires we kept hidden in the daylight. We both knew it was wrong, but the thrill of the secret, the taboo nature of it all, it was addictive. Back home, it got worse, or maybe it got easier, a terrible kind of easy. John's job got crazy busy, he was working late all the time and coming home exhausted. I was alone more often than not. At first, the silence in the house felt deafening, a constant reminder of the distance growing between us. Then Mark filled it, text messages during my solo dinners, a quick meme shared during my lunch break, little flirtatious pick-me UPS sent straight to my phone throughout the day. The guilt still gnawed at me, a constant companion I couldn't shake. But it was mixed with something else anticipation, desperation, a hunger for the connection I was missing. Mark was filling the hole in my life that John wasn't even aware existed, and as terrible as it felt, it also felt strangely exhilarating. Maybe it wasn't just Mark or my boredom, maybe there was something broken in me, some part one hadn't even recognized, that was seeking fulfillment outside of my marriage. Whatever it was, I found myself further and further down this dangerous path, one late night text at a time. The day John told me about his work conference, my heart did a little skip. Three nights alone, three whole nights where I wouldn't have to hide whispered phone calls or invent tired excuses. I'm a terrible person, I know. But as awful as it felt, I couldn't deny the thrill of possibility coursing through me. Like clockwork, the same day I found out about John's trip, an email popped up from Mark. Business in Chicago, it read, small world, huh? The wink emoji at the end told me everything. We wouldn't say anything outright, but we both knew what this meant. The hotel room felt strange at first, generic furniture, an oversized bed, stark and impersonal, yet buzzing with the wrong sort of energy. The first time Mark touched me, my hands shook. This wasn't some flirty coffee run, this was crossing a line I'd never even thought possible. But his eyes held a sort of desperate pleading, echoing the same hidden one I'd felt for so long. Guilt sat in the corner of the room like a silent observer, a buzzing fly I could sweat away for a few hours but always returned. Yet, the excitement, the sheer exhilaration of sharing a secret with this man, was overpowering. And later, after, amidst the rumpled sheets, I wouldn't even let myself think too hard about what I'd done. Home felt alien after those few days. John seemed so happy to see me, unsuspecting and trusting, and it made my insides twist. He surprised me with a beautiful necklace, a sparkly thing that hung heavy around my neck like a physical weight of my betrayal. We went out to dinner, and he laughed at my jokes, talked about his week like it had been perfectly normal. You've been on your phone a lot lately, he said at one point, catching my eye with a gentle look of concern, not accusation. Especially late at night. I froze. 
My forced smile felt painfully obvious, my voice too high when I replied, oh, just silly work stuff, you know how it is. His eyes held mine for a beat longer, but then he nodded, the worried crease between his brows fading. Guilt stabbed at me, sharp and hot. But just as quickly, I pushed it down. Mark would understand, right? Mark was going through the same thing, wasn't he? It wasn't just me, it couldn't be. The invitation from Sarah felt like a cruel joke. A weekend getaway with her and her husband, plus. Mark. Of course, they didn't know. Nobody knew. But even the thought of being around him in this forced, social situation was enough to set my stomach in knots. John seemed excited about it, oblivious to the internal battle I was fighting. The house they rented was huge, all exposed beams and floor-to-ceiling windows. It meant less chance of getting caught, but it also made it impossible to avoid Mark. Even while surrounded by people, there was an invisible thread connecting us. A touch that lingered too long while passing the salad at dinner, a shared look when someone told a slightly off-color joke, a brush of hands while getting drinks in the kitchen. Each time, a spark ignited, a reckless thrill coursing through me. It was like we were playing a dangerous, unspoken game, our movements calculated under the noses of our unsuspecting partners. Sarah chattered away about decorating ideas for their house while I sipped my wine, desperately trying not to stare at how Mark's shirt clung to his shoulders when he reached for another bottle across the counter. Late one night, I heard a soft knock at my door. Mark. One look at his face, flushed and eyes bright, told me everything. He didn't have to say a word. In that moment, in that quiet moonlit hallway, the consequences felt impossibly distant. All I knew was this overwhelming urge, a need to fill the hollow space inside me that had been growing for so long. The next morning, that sickening buzz of my phone broke through the heavy fog of sleep. A text. Mark. But the screen went black before I could catch the words. Something felt wrong. I turned over. And then my blood ran cold. John was holding my phone, his face a mask of shock and betrayal. I scrambled for an explanation, some excuse, but the dam had broken. He knew. The argument that followed was a hurricane, tearing through our carefully constructed life. Years of bottled up frustrations, of unspoken needs and disappointments, exploded in harsh accusations and tear-filled confessions. John's voice cracked when he spoke of trust, of love lost. My own tears burned as I tried to apologize, trying in vain to explain the emptiness, the desperate feeling of drifting I'd been fighting. Nothing made sense. Everything was a shattered mess on the bedroom floor. After the fight, after John choked out the words, I need some space, and slammed the door to the guest room, all that was left was the deafening silence. I sat on the edge of the bed, our bed, fingers tracing patterns on the too soft comforter. Everything felt wrong, twisted, like the world had tilted on its axis. Night fell, heavy and oppressive. Sleep was a cruel joke. I closed my eyes but only saw flashes of John's face, the hurt and anger etched so deeply it made me physically ache. My mind conjured up our wedding day, usually a happy memory, now distorted. I heard his vows, promising forever, but all I could see was the look of betrayal from earlier that morning. The next few days passed in a painful haze. The house was vast and empty, John a ghost who moved through rooms with tight lips and cold eyes. His silence was worse than any screaming match, it was utter rejection, confirming my worst fears about myself and what I'd done. I wanted to apologize, to try to explain, but I'd lost the right to any of that. Each time I opened my mouth, all that came out were empty, pathetic excuses. I tried to busy myself, doing laundry, cleaning the kitchen until the countertop sparkled. Anything to distract from the churning guilt in the constant loop in my head. How did I let this happen? What was wrong with me? Nights were the worst. I'd lie awake in the too big bed, the silence punctuated only by the rhythmic hum of the refrigerator or the occasional creak of the old house. I'd stare at the ceiling, imagining Mark's face, trying in vain to recapture the thrill of those secret moments. The adrenaline had been replaced by a deep, bone-aching fear. Fear of what I'd done to my marriage, my life, and worst of all, fear of what was next. I craved answers, resolution, some sign that it was possible to fix this, but John's icy silence was an insurmountable wall. A week. It took him a week to finally break the silence. It might as well have been a decade. I jumped when I heard his voice, raspy and strained, coming from the doorway of the living room. We need to talk, he said. There was no anger, no yelling. 
just a flat monotone that scared me more than any shouting could have. My mind raced. Apologize. Plead with him. Fight back. A lump rose in my throat, threatening to choke out any words I could manage. He sat on the worn armchair across from me, looking older somehow, the easy smile I once loved now replaced with a hard line across his lips. I want a divorce, he said simply. It felt like a physical blow, even though I'd known deep down this was coming. John, I started, my voice barely above a whisper, but the words caught in my throat. It was pointless, we both knew it. Some things, once broken, simply can't be mended. Somehow, with a strength I didn't know I had, I choked out. Okay. Maybe some part of him, or maybe just some part of me, hoped for a flicker of emotion. Sadness, regret, even a flash of anger. But there was nothing, just a chilling acceptance that made the finality of it all so much worse. In the days that followed, the mundane became excruciating. We existed side by side, like strangers forced to share a cramped hotel room. The lawyer consultations were a blur of legal jargon that barely registered in my shocked mind. Gone was the sweet, somewhat shy man I'd married. In his place, a calculating stranger fought over who got to keep the stupid coffee mugs we'd bought on our honeymoon. We split our CDs like children dividing up toys, the music that was once the soundtrack to our lives now just another thing to be fought over. I winced when his hand lingered near a few of my favorites, a petty jab amidst the clinical division of our possessions. Even packing my things felt wrong. My clothes folded into boxes that would soon leave this house, the house that was supposed to be our home. The ache of what we'd lost was a constant presence, a weight that settled deep in my bones. Sometimes I wanted to scream, to rage at him, at myself, at the whole damn unfairness of it all. But pride, that last stubborn shred of it, choked back the worst of it. I played it cool, matching his cold efficiency with my own. Because what else was there left to do? Sarah cornered me at a neighborhood barbecue a few weeks later. Her smile was tight, and her eyes flickered over my shoulder as if searching for John. It wasn't hard to figure out that he'd spilled at least some version of the truth to her. I'm so sorry, she said, her voice pitched low, a weird mix of sympathy and awkwardness. I had no idea. My cheeks burned. Sarah, it's okay, it's between me and John, really, I insisted, even though the words tasted like ashes in my mouth. She nodded, but not convincingly. The other women in our shared circle of friends drifted by, offering brief hugs or forced smiles. The pity in their eyes stung worse than open anger would have. News of the divorce had traveled fast, and with it came the whispers, the judgment, the way everyone looked at me like I was an empty shell of the woman they once knew. Mark was another ghost in my life. When the truth came out, his promises of S against the world melted away faster than snow in a summer heatwave. A hurried phone call, his voice strained, untransferring out of state, fresh start, you understand. Then a week later, nothing. Not even a goodbye text to mark the pathetic end of our disastrous little affair. His silence was an echo of John's, only worse, somehow. Betrayal came in different forms, I realize. John's hurt was raw and honest, but Mark, Mark was a coward, the kind of man who vanished at the first hint of trouble, leaving me with the bitter realization that I'd traded my whole life for someone who didn't have the spine to even apologize. The ache of loneliness settled over me, heavier than before. Dinner parties and girls' nights out were no longer invitations but reminders. I'd stare at the ringing phone, hoping for a friend's voice, a flicker of my old life. Instead, there was the constant echo of unanswered texts to Mark, the silence from my once bustling social circle a painful counterpoint to the hollowness inside me. My new apartment wasn't so much a home as it was a box to keep my things in. The silence, broken only by the hum of traffic outside, was oppressive. Here, there was nobody to distract me from the full weight of my mistakes. Mark, the grand passion that seemed worth ruining my life for, faded into a shameful memory. The thrill was long gone, replaced by a bone-deep loneliness that gnawed at me day and night. News of John's life trickled through like a leaky faucet. A mutual friend let slip that he was dating again. I tried to conjure up a feeling of indifference, but a knot tightened in my stomach. Later, at the grocery store, I spotted him with a woman by his side. She had a kind smile, and as he laughed at something she said, a flash of jealousy sliced through me. He looked happy, cared for. Everything I'd thrown away was now worn so effortlessly by someone else. Work became my escape. I threw myself into projects, stayed late, took on extra assignments. 
The promotions came, the bonuses, but with each accomplishment, the emptiness yawned a little wider. These had been our dreams once, the things we'd talked about building together. Now, they were just hollow victories, milestones in a life devoid of real meaning. Years blurred by in a haze of work and forced attempts at socializing. Sarah's Instagram became an exercise in self-torture. Photos of their smiling family, John holding a little boy with his same kind eyes, a life that should have been mine. News of their second child hit me hard. That future, the one full of laughter and warmth, was irrevocably gone. I knew it, yet a foolish, desperate part of me still clung to some twisted fantasy of reconciliation. Then, reality crashed down, an avalanche burying those pathetic dreams forever. Dating apps became a lifeline, a way to drown out the silence. The swiping, the dull conversations, the men who bore no resemblance to John. It was all a depressing exercise in futility. John's quiet strength, his subtle humor, the things I'd foolishly taken for granted, made every other man pale in comparison. None of them talked about restoring old engines or shared my love for dusty car shows. Finally, one night, fueled by wine and desperation, I found myself at Sarah's doorstep. It was pathetic, I knew it, but I couldn't take it anymore. I spilled everything the regret, the shame, the all-consuming emptiness. Sarah listened patiently, but the pity in her eyes was almost worse than I could bear. The morning after, her husband called. His voice was strained, full of the disappointment I'd come to expect. But there was something else, a hint of surprise. Look, he said, John, he never said a bad word about you. Not even one, after everything. The realization hit me hard. All this time, maybe there was a flicker of the old John somewhere, a part of him that remembered our history with some kindness instead of just the betrayal at the end. It was a slim thread to cling to, but in my barren landscape of regret, it was